because you know I'm used to seeing people and their reactions and uh, it's a little bit different but it's distracting if you have all those odd little pictures going so it works out nice uh, having that off at the moment but I'll be real happy to try and answer questions at the end if not you can contact me by email and I'll see what information I can get you if there's anything in particular um, I am going to go to share my screen so give me a second here to get to the PowerPoint there we are um, so we're going to be talking about heirloom vegetables and uh, there's some basic information that I'm going to cover on heirlooms, kind of, you know, how they're defined, what you need to know about their benefits and some of the drawbacks. And then I'm going to go through a number of kind of unusual but interesting heirloom vegetables you can get to. So we'll start with, um, okay, it doesn't want to progress down. Let's go. Come on. Okay, my PowerPoint is not moving. Hang on. I think I'm going to go back to the other one and try it a little different. So let me stop share there. We'll go here, we'll go to this one. And we'll go to this. Let's see if that lets me, there we go. So basically what is an heirloom? It's kind of interesting because when you start to um, read different books or look up different information, the time frames on what they consider to be an heirloom can really vary quite a bit. Most want it over 50 years. So if it's 50 years or older, it's an heirloom. There's not a whole lot more to it. There's just a straight time frame. Others think it should predate World War II, puts it back a little, you know, extra 30 years, but it's not a big deal. Um, a number of vegetables were really more defined by the time World War II came around that over the years, the breeders kind of selected and created a uh, strains that are what we're using now, but they are actually managed. They were um, kind of bred till they got to the point the person liked them, and then they continued growing that seed. Um, a number of them were late 1800s into the early 1900s. And then there are those that want to go back 100 years. So they want it older. It should be at least 100 years old. Um, but for a lot of the heirloom vegetables, we really don't have a, a, a good time frame to say, oh, yes, it's exactly 100 years or 200 or whatever. They go through multi, uh, multiple generations. So someone may turn in seeds to, to a seed saving company and explain that they know that their great grandmother grew these because their grandmother told them. And so they've got to be at least this old, but they're not really sure exactly how old they are. So some you get a stronger history on than others, but they definitely are going to be older seeds, things that have come down through the years um, and that we consider to be, you know, a passed down something that existed and from which our newer strains have been drawn or our new varieties have been created from most of these vegetables. They are all open pollinated. So basically that means um, the wind carries the pollen or insects carry the pollen. And as long as they're not, um, uh, one that can cross pollinate. For instance, like tomatoes and beans tend to be more self pollinating. You're not likely to get across. But if you have heirlooms that say come from the um, cucumber family or the melon family, uh, the beet family, some of those can cross pollinate. So if you're trying to grow several species or several varieties of the same vegetable, you may want to make sure they have space between them to prevent cross pollinating if they're the type that will do that. So you kind of have to look that up. But some of your basics, you know, the tomato and the beans and such, they will not. Corn, there's a lot of heirloom corn, but you never plant corn of different varieties close to each other because they will cross pollinate and that will affect the seed and you don't want that to happen. Um, so basically open pollinated by wind and insects. Now, people can often intervene if they want to preserve a particular type of vegetable and they will go in and prevent that flower from pollinating in other ways and they'll continue to pollinate it by hand or whatever that is not what you consider an heirloom there's no you know intervention that we select for so they're all open pollinated however not open all open pollinated plants are heirlooms. For instance, the new varieties of corn or beets or whatever, they will, um, they will uh, be open pollinated, but they're technically not an heirloom. They're not old enough yet to be that way. But once a particular plant produces the same characteristics every year, 
um, and you continue to grow that plant for at least 50 years, then it becomes an heirloom. So as time passes, some of the uh, newer varieties created like in the 1990s will eventually become heirlooms. It's just a matter of that time frame and that the characteristics stay stable to that particular variety. So the, the question is, you know, do I really want to grow an heirloom? What's the difference? Is there a higher cost? Sometimes there's a higher cost. Sometimes it's something that's been around a long time and no, it's going to be the same cost as anything else. Um, but for the flavor, most people feel that the heirlooms really do have a superior flavor to some of the newer uh, varieties of vegetables. The nutrition, again, um, it depends. You want a rainbow of colors. And by going into your heirlooms, you often get more colors. Uh, for instance, when you think of carrots and the standard orange carrot, those are many heirloom, you know, carrots, they're straight orange, but they have the same type of nutrition. Now, when you add in some of the purple carrots, you get different like antioxidants, different types of nutritional value. So the nice thing about heirlooms is there are a range of colors there that you can bring into the garden. Um, there's also a range of colors you can get with newer varieties, but most people consider that heirlooms do have a higher nutrition value. It's nice because they're open pollinated. You don't have to worry about what you're growing. You should be able to save the seeds um, as long as you didn't you know, plant varieties that would cross pollinate too close to each other. But basically open pollination, you're gonna get the same seed and you can save it and you can replant it. Now they say they ripen little by little. That depends on what it is you're growing. Um, but they normally are not gonna produce a huge amount all at one time unless they're uh, like a determinate tomato. Um, with tomatoes, you have indeterminate, which continue to grow and produce the tomatoes all through the time the plant is growing. And then you have determinant where the vines do tend to stop growing at a point and they produce a larger abundance of fruit within a shorter time frame. So uh, it's knowing a little bit about the vegetable you're growing. But you can kind of watch and see as far as the ripening goes. Uh, once you check the seed and it gives you a rough idea on the time for maturity, just begin watching and weather can always affect that. They say usually less expensive than hybrids, mainly because they are open pollinated. Hybrids, they have to make sure that the two parent plants are crossbreeding and will create the seed you want to continue growing the hybrid. You always have to cross these two parent plants to get the third. And the hybrid seeds will not come through to be in that same a vegetable. They'll, they will have a difference in something about it because the two parent plants have been crossbred. Um, so it, it takes more time or effort to create those hybrids. So normally heirlooms will be a little bit uh, less expensive as would any other open pollinated plant. They're nice um, because of biodiversity. I, I think most gardeners know now that the more varieties you have, the larger the gene pool you can draw from, the more likely you are to find something resistant if a disease comes along. And so by having that um, genetic diversity, you have the ability to create plants that maybe will be less uh, affected by you know, different wilts or different types of diseases. And biodiversity is really important. Um, a few years back, I think they were talking about the problems with our uh, banana plants, that the common banana that are seedless uh, that we mostly buy at the grocery store, they come from like just one strain. And if they were ever attacked by a particular uh, disease, there's a good chance that they'd all be wiped out because there was no genetic material there that is different that would help them maybe sustain the, the initial problem. So you do want to have biodiversity. And the, the fun thing about them is so many have a history and you can look that up and it's kind of interesting. Um, I know on one seed packet I got, they gave a little bit of the history. It was one of those um, carrot packets where they had the yellow and the purple and the orange and the red carrots all kind of mixed. You get a nice rainbow packet of seeds. And they mentioned on the back that the Dutch actually developed uh, the, the orange carrot and selected that to grow because the Royal House of Orange ruled Holland at the time. And so it was a tribute to that house to grow the orange carrot and they just became the popular carrot. Um, other colored carrots have been around for centuries too. You know, it's just the history is kind of fun to look at with some of these. And some of the books that are out there uh, really do give you a, a greater sense of the history of that particular vegetable. 
Now, there are some problems with heirlooms, uh, and the fact is they're not always pretty, sometimes because they lack a disease resistance, so they might have a stunted growth or a problem that uh, can be out there in the soil. Uh, some of them, like tomatoes, they may be more inclined to do cat facing or to split when there's a sudden growth period than some others that have been bred not to do that. So they aren't always the prettiest looking vegetables, but they usually have a, a really good nutrition, a good flavor. Um, and so the, the fruit production, which I think is true of any garden, you know, the production can vary year to year, primarily based upon your weather conditions. So to really get the most out of your heirlooms, you may have to, you know, be more aware of how much water they're getting or the type of soil they're in um, to try and make sure they get the best production uh, for that year. And so again, Many do lack some disease resistance, so you need to kind of investigate when you go to get an heirloom uh, to see if the catalog tells you if it is resistant to any particular wilts or fungal problems. So uh, just bear that in mind. Now there's a lot of places that are now carrying heirloom seeds. Uh, some places like uh, any seeds or seed savers, they're solely gonna deal with heirloom uh, type of vegetables. Others that have been around for years, your general catalogs for companies that have been around, they will carry not only newer varieties, but they will also usually have heirlooms available. Some of the catalogs will put them in an entire section just listing heirloom vegetables. Others simply indicate it in the catalog with a, some kind of lettering or a symbol to let you know that this is considered an heirloom. So catalogs are very good simply because they give you such a variety. I mean they can have a, a real range and you can check a wide range of catalogs because some will carry a, a particular plant that another might not. And so you can really, um, in the winter months, get those catalogs for the upcoming year and start comparing what's available to what you think you would like and see what you, you want to start to order and begin to plant. So catalogs are really, for the biggest variety, the best place. Farmers markets are now carrying a lot of heirlooms. The, the growers can tell you if it's considered an heirloom. Um, they might be more restricted on the number of plants that are available, uh, but they're a good source to talk to the farmer and find out, you know, if they're growing them, uh, are there any particular things you need to know? Do they find that certain soils are better? Do they need to be, you know, watched for certain diseases or insect problems? So you can talk to the farmer at a farmer's market and that is very helpful. Many of the garden centers now carry both the seed packets or they might carry the actual plant for transplanting. Again, depending on the garden center, you might have someone there who's knowledgeable in those plants that can answer questions and you might not. So you, it's always good to have a few books on hand, go online maybe, or talk to other gardeners to see what experiences they have. The libraries uh, do have a lot of books. I know right now it is particularly difficult to get to a library. They're not all open. Some are restricting either the hours or the number of patrons in the library. Um, ours presently does have uh, curbside service. So if you can contact the librarian, tell her what you're looking for, they will set aside some books, check them out for you and bring them out to the car. So uh, there are some really good ones out there that do give you some wonderful information on um, the heirlooms and their background and their history. Uh, again, bookstores are another problem because they're not all open, but if they are, you can peruse the bookstore, see what they have available. Naturally, with the internet, you can go online to bookstores and look up all kinds of different books and magazines. And they're like uh, Heirloom Gardener, there are some magazines that are specifically on heirloom gardening and they give you a lot of good information. A lot of people's personal insight uh, on the vegetables that they're growing. Um, anything that they've learned that might be um, helpful to the gardener. So these are all good sources and very reliable to get. Um, you know, it's one of the big things they teach you as master gardeners is know that you have a reliable source. If you go to the internet, try to make sure it's, it's uh, a edu. Not all blogs are really good, uh, but check your source on the internet to make sure it's reliable and not just hand me down information that may or may not actually uh, be applicable. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at some different heirlooms. I did not include tomatoes, and that's simply because those are the easiest it seems to get, the most available at farmer's markets. Um, 
they're really, you know, a lot of them, brandy wine people have been growing for a long time. There's uh, Cherokee purple, that's been around a long time. Those are all heirlooms. Um, so you can check at your, at your farmer's market or your, uh, in your catalogs and get a lot of different tomatoes to grow. And most of your vegetables, same growing conditions, you know, beets like particular thing. There are some vegetables that will tolerate more uh, cool climate, which are better for us. So you might want to check into that if they, you know, will tolerate cool weather, you may still be able to get the seeds and plant them this year if they will, you know, have maybe a 50 or 60 day maturity rate. So I thought I'd start with green globes and things that people don't normally grow because, uh, well, artichokes, we figure warmer climates, more California. Um, but green globe is an heirloom. It's been around for oh, a long time. It's as available as early as 1825. So it's nearly 200 years old um, that that's been available. And it does take cooler zones. They said even up to zone three and we're now at a six. So, you know, you shouldn't have a big problem with that. Uh, you want the, the buds before they open. The part of the plant you're eating is the flower head on an artichoke. So you don't want to let it start to create the flower, but you want a full head. And usually what you'll find is that the terminal head, the one at the top, is going to be larger than the side heads. And that's fairly normal. Um, so you want to look to uh, harvesting those. And if you decide you don't actually want to eat the artichokes, let them open. They make beautiful flowers. They're very bright purple tinged flowers. Uh, so that is an option. Uh, these are very flavorful. They take about 75 days to mature from the transplant. Uh, many of our vegetables uh, that have the need for warmer weather or prefer a little bit warmer weather, you do want to start more as a transplant than from the seed. But if you do order the seed, be sure you are able to start it indoors under the proper conditions. Um, putting your seedlings on a windowsill is not going to give them the light they need. They really need the right light. They need moisture. And if you're starting the seeds inside the house, they need a little bit of wind on them once in a while to help develop a stronger stem. So make sure that you know how to start seeds indoors and what, what's a little bit different about starting them. Uh, too many times people just think, oh, I got a nice bright window, I'll put them there. And uh, that does not work well for that plant. Um, also, you'll notice I did try to quote uh, where I got the information from to give you an idea of the type of information different catalogs can provide. And then uh, where the photos came from, I tried to make sure the credit was there. You could see um, that they're also offered, say, by a different company than the one I got the information from. So you will find them in multiple places there's still going to be green globe artichoke, okay? Dragon's tongue. Now, these, these are kind of fun for kids. If, if you're going to grow something a little bit different, a lot of the vegetables I have here are great if you have children or if you have grandchildren and you want to garden with them and do something different uh, just to keep them a little more interested. For kids, the name dragon's tongue is probably really fun. You know, I'm going to eat a dragon's tongue. It's, it's just kind of an interesting thing. Um, it's like deer tongue lettuce, you know, it's a little bit different shape. It gives them a different feel for what they're eating. So dragon's tongue is a nice bush bean, uh, comes from a Dutch background, and they, they make really nice long pods, about seven inches. It's a nice size pod. They would probably be classified in with the yellow wax beans because they are a yellow bean, but they've got these purple streaks, which are really cute. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And makes them rather popular. Thing is, once you cook them, just like the purple green beans will do, they lose that purple and they'll they'll just turn yellow. Uh, but they really are, are kind of a fun one to, to grow. And they are used a lot, especially in Europe. Um, they're considered more of a gourmet type bean. So that's kind of a nice one. And then cylindra beet, I put that one in simply because it is long and narrow. So you're able to plant more of those beets in a given area than the ones that need space that create the larger round base. And because they're cylindrical, you get nice even slices as you're working with those, which makes it kind of nice when you're canning or, or pickling or doing something where you want them to be uh, pretty much the same size. So it mentions that they are easy to peel and uh, they don't take long, 46 to 80 days. Um, so, you know, some of the beets will tolerate cooler weather. You can uh, maybe get those seeds and even try planting them now. Uh, but cylinder was just a neat one simply for the length of the shape. Five to six inches long gives you a nice amount of beet. 
and it's nice even sized spaces. And again, it's a nice little heirloom. Purple Vienna, I, I think a lot of people have grown the green Vienna kohlrabi. Uh, purple Vienna is nice because it's just a different color. You get that, that purple on the outside. Um, I'm not sure how many people have eaten kohlrabi. It is kind of in the cabbage family, uh, but it looks more like a turnip and you're basically eating the stem. Uh, you can kind of see where the leaves are coming off. You have nodes in between. So it's really a bulbous stem that you're eating. A good way to help teach children about stems and the different shapes they can take. Um, but remember with these Viennas, the green and the purple Vienna, these uh, heirloom varieties, often you don't want them to get really large. You don't want a softball size head because they will get very woody inside. They're, they're not pleasant to eat that way. You want to get them when they're younger. Um, maybe more like racquetball or baseball, the smaller sizes, uh, two, I mean, not even more than three inches across, smaller. And then they're very tender, they're very good creamed. That's how my mom used to make them, was, was creamed. Um, so this is a nice little variety that you can um, look at uh, if you wanna grow something a little different. Some of these actually look kind of nice in your flower garden. It adds just an, a little bit of different color down in there um, to what you're growing. I put in ox heart carrot, because I found these kind of fascinating for the size. They're absolutely huge carrots. Um, they're not terribly long, maybe five or six inches, and that makes them really suitable if you want to container grow them. And a lot of these that only get a few inches long in their base are good for containers, even that cylinder beet. You can do those in pots. Um, and with the ox heart though, you're gonna wanna spread them out a little because they get very round. And so at five or six inches, they can weigh up to a pound or even more. They're, they're really big, fat little carrots and they're really kind of neat. And the name ox heart is kind of fun for the kids. Um, and they will take heavier soils, uh, which is nice for our area of Michigan. Um, we do have pockets of sandy soils, but a lot of our soils are more clay and a lot of them are stony. So if you can keep your soil kind of free of stones for several inches, uh, you can get some really good thick carrots and uh, work with those. So it's something just a little bit different to try. Bear paw corn uh, was popular back in the 20s and 30s. And I guess it was like the popcorn for the movie theaters. That, that was the type you would get if they went to the movie theater. They're not terribly tall corn plants. They only get about five feet maybe. And uh, they, they were used uh, and shown at the World's Fair back in the 30s. Um, the uh, kernels are of nice white color. They're not big ears because again, it's only four to five inches, but you know, they make plenty of popcorn. And uh, they call them bear paws because they can split at the silk end and then you get this broadened out, you know, ear of corn, which looks very cool. Uh, kids think this is really fun to see. and. Uh, so that's how it got its name, just from that splitting and the way that opens up. Uh, it's, it's kind of neat, but that is another heirloom that was very popular at the beginning of the, uh, the 20th century. Uh, hasn't been grown as much, but the seeds are out there. You can find them. The lemon cucumber, this is one um, that has a history because it was through natural selection. They guys just kind of looked at it, selected that and kept growing that seed until they've got this lemon cucumber that at this point will stay true to, to that lemon size and that color and that flavor. Um, well, it was uh, in the late 19th centuries where it came from, didn't get to the US until 1894, which is the late 19th century, early 20th. Um, it's the, it's kind of neat because it doesn't have that cucurbitacin, which is uh, when you get too much, you get a very bitter taste in your, your uh, cucumbers. You don't really want that bitterness there. So this one actually they say is more citrusy flavored, um, which would really be nice in a salad. And it's also something again, different that children can look at that and go, that's a cucumber, you know, that's, that's different. And uh, so again, if you are gonna grow this as well as a regular cucumber, you don't want to plant them next to each other. They could cross-pollinate. You won't be able to save the seed. Um, since you're eating the fruit, it's not going to be a problem, but you won't want to go with the seed. You'd probably have to get new. Um, so again, different companies have that available and describe it a, you know, a little bit different each, but lemon cucumber. Casper eggplant, that uh, is a neat little eggplant. It's a white eggplant. There's quite a variety of eggplants out there now. 
um, from purple to the mottled white and purple to the plain white. Uh, Casper is a nice little one, um, about five, six inches long. And uh, they mentioned the flavor, kind of a mushroom-like flavor, which is kind of a little different to, to consider. I, I'm not a big eggplant person, so, and I don't really like mushrooms that much, but I'm thinking of trying this one just to see how it comes across. Um, and what they do mention is that it actually can handle cooler conditions uh, right up until frost. So this would be kind of a, a one to look at for our climate um, that can handle some of the cooler temperatures. So if you wanna plant certain things in the garden a little later in the season, you just check you know, how soon you're expecting the first frost of the fall, back it out and you can uh, have something really neat and different. But they're about five to six inches long, nice, bright, pretty white color. And then there's the Minnesota Midget Melon. I, I really kind of like this thought because um, it's small. It's only like four inches across, they mentioned. So it's kind of like a single serving melon in my mind. Uh, and it can produce, it mentions two crops. So it would be kind of a neat thing to grow because you can you know, have more. You can also use it in container because the vines, they don't get terribly long. They mention about three feet, not, not much longer than that. So it's, it's kind of a neat little uh, melon for a small area. And especially if only one or two people are eating it, you don't have to have this huge melon you got to figure out what to do with or eat, you know. Although if you really like melon, those big melons are great too. You can eat one of those in a day. Um, probably shouldn't, but they, you can. But these are really nice uh, simply because they're smaller and they you can eat the flesh right to the rind. And uh, very sweet, very nice. And note that in this case, they mentioned it's resistant to fusarium wilt. Uh, a lot of our melon plants the, and a lot of the cucurbits uh, are very susceptible to different types of wilts and fungal diseases. So where you can, look to see if they mention that there is that disease resistance available. Um, so that's kind of a neat one. And then Stone Mountain Watermelon. Um, a nice melon out of Georgia. Uh, notice there is a, another name for it. Some call it Dixie Bell. Uh, several of these heirlooms are going to have different names when you look them up in a catalog. Usually they will mention also known as, and so you can identify it with the original heirloom. Um, but Stone Mountain is a nice size, but you're going to get a lot of weight there, 30 pounds. That's a big amount of melon, um, and it has a thick rind. But that can be a benefit if you like to pickle the rind of a watermelon, you want that thicker rind. So, you know, you got to kind of look for what you're going to be doing with these melons when you pick them out to order and to grow them and see if you can select for the things you want to do. You've got the red flesh to eat. You've got the thicker rind, though, if you'd like to pickle it. And they mentioned 80 to 95 days. It's uh, uh, fairly short. You can get melons that go a lot longer than that to really reach maturity and need heat the whole time. Um, so 80 to 95 days really kind of works well within uh, the Michigan growing season. So that watermelon is kind of a, of a cool choice. And then the Lassonado kale, uh, usually dinosaur kale is how I was always kind of refer to it. A lot of uh, the catalogs simply call it dinosaur kale or Tuscan kale, Toscano, Toscana, de depends on the catalog you get it from. Um, dates back to the 18th century, which is the 1700s. So Thomas Jefferson grew to Monticello, so it kind of gives you a historical connection. Um, it's kind of, again, fun with the kids to be able to talk about the vegetables, how long they've been around, where they were used, uh, that type of a thing. And again, they mentioned these are sweeter, milder, and heavily crinkled. And they really do suggest picking the younger leaves, not the really big ones. They're going to, as they get larger, be a little bit more tough. Um, but the young ones are very good. And after the first frost, they're sweeter. So these tolerate frost, and they're really going to be good. Um, you mentioned you can blanch them, broil them, braise them. Uh, very good uh, choice for a kale, and, and kind of different because uh, those leaves can get 18 inches long. That's a nice foot and a half leaf. That, that's kind of impressive for the kids to look at and to see. Now, those are pretty much all of the vegetables. I put this little information in just to let you know that this is kind of an interesting thing. But if you haven't heard of it, there are a number of global seed vaults. But this Svalbard Global Seed Vault, it's uh, 
was created by the Norwegian government, uh, the uh, trust, what's it called, the crop trust, and then an, uh, a company that does uh, genetic research, studies these things. And they were concerned that a lot of uh, problems are occurring in our environment, uh, a lot of issues with our governments. And in the case of some cataclysmic event, uh, it would be good to preserve and save seeds, especially you know from heirlooms, things that we really um, rely on. And if we had to start over again, have you know withstood the test of time, these would be good. So there's a, an island in the Svalbard archipelago that uh, halfway between Norway and the North Pole, so it's cold. Um, that is where they built this. The Norwegian government footed the bill, and these three companies worked together. And it is a long-term storage facility. So they call they, they say it has a, a black box system. Basically, companies that or the, the countries that participate send their seeds, quantities of 500 or more, in these black boxes, and they can withdraw them whenever they want, or you know, and send them in to store whenever they want. And it's built down into the earth. The temperature is uh, below the frost zone. It is very, very cold. But it's the right temperature for long-term seed preservation. And I forget how many thousands of different types of seeds they have room to store at so many thousand per seed. It's like over a million different, I think it's like two and a half million seeds could be stored within that vault. Um, but it's one way that uh, they're working to make sure we continue to have our vegetables and our fruits and other seeds that really could matter if we did have a, some sort of cataclysmic problem. Um, so I, I just kind of shared that for some general information. But basically when it comes to heirlooms, it really is simple. They're simply heirlooms because of their age. They do have benefits in their nutritional value, um, but they aren't always pretty and they can be far more susceptible to diseases than some of the newer varieties. So it's really up to you as a gardener to determine, you know, what exactly you want out of your garden. Is the heirloom something you want to spend the time in to make sure, you know, you're getting what you want? You can experiment and play. I wouldn't say, you know, let's just get rid of all the other varieties and go strictly with heirlooms. Um, because again, you may run into some problems in terms of the disease resistance. But if you're looking for different flavors, if you want to create something different and unusual in your garden to share with your friends and impress them with these cool things you're doing, uh, heirlooms provide a lot of that. Um, that, I think, took me to the end of that PowerPoint. So I will stop my share. And I know this is kind of a uh, shorter PowerPoint or shorter presentation. Uh, but if anybody does have any questions, I might be able to answer those. and. Uh, if you think of something later, uh, you can get in touch with me by email. If you uh, need it, I can give that to you uh, at the end of the program here. So we can make sure to, to include that email address in, a, in an e-blast too, if, if you're okay with sure. it. Oh yes, absolutely, no problem. Um, did anybody have any, any questions for Mary? Um, if you need any help unmuting, you can you know, do the raise your hand thing on the the, the Zoom or feel free to use the chat as well. Um, or, you know, you should shoot me an email too if you need help and I can talk through it on that as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, now's, now's your opportunity. And th this, this will be record or uh, is being recorded and we will have it up on, on YouTube too. So we'll have Sally send out a, an e-blast when the link to that is available as well. So get this information again which is really yeah. good really appreciate it and are you seeing the chat right now or the local seed saving um you can check with a couple of your libraries i've heard that there are a few of the local libraries that are starting a, a, a library seed saving area so that they will have them available um but other than that i'm not sure of any locally but do, do contact a few of the libraries in the area. Uh, you can go online and look up if there are any, um, you know, seed saving, I uh, can't think of what I want to call them right now, but uh, some libraries are making it possible to share seeds. Uh, you do have to be careful. There are certain requirements that people have to follow when they do these seed saving groups. 
Uh, in some cases, if you take seeds out, you are expected to not only grow the plant, but you are to return seeds to the library to share the following year with people. Um, it's not always, you know, I can go get my seeds, but I don't have to return anything. So check into what uh, possible rules they may have in regard to these seeds. Uh, you, you, you know, you're trusting the person who sent them in to know what they're giving that seed library and that they're going to come true to what they say. Uh, and they trust you that if you're turning in seeds that they'll come true to what you say as well. Uh, if you want to buy heirloom seeds, I think I gave Amanda the, the list of companies and I put in bold the ones that were Michigan based companies. I think there's one in St. Clair. Um, I think Annie's is uh, not too far from here. Uh, I want to say somewhere in the Port Huron area, but I'm not sure. Uh, but if uh, you're looking to buy them or purchase them, um, check that list and it's got a link on it for the companies so you can get in contact with them. And we'll have that, we'll have to post that to the website and send that out again as well too, so that if you missed it when it was first sent out, you will be able to get it again as well. Did anybody else have any more questions or? Amanda? Yeah. Um, this is Julie. There was somebody in our group who had an older tomato plant um, that was given to Victory Seeds, um, Mike Dutton, and he was going to feature that in their seed because it was a uh, um, Nora Wojciechowski had received this from a senior gardener at the Southfield um, Senior Gardens back in the 90s. So I know Victory Seeds, I believe, sells older type heirloom seeds. And the one in, in particular that they were gonna grow was called AZ Cutler, C-U-T-L-E-R. And Mike was trying to grow those to get enough to put in the seed um, catalog for this past year. So that's a nice connection to somebody who was with the Master Gardener program for many, many years. Yeah. It's, it's really nice that um, a lot of the catalogs will actually tell you where the seeds were contributed from whom and you know when they were given and a little history to them. Uh, so you will find a, a variety of master gardeners or fairly well-known names uh, of people who got seeds and have passed them on into those seed catalogs. But it's nice if you have somebody local you can really identify with. Well, Mike Dutton at Victory Seeds was working with Craig uh, Lahoulier, which was a speaker at our Master Gardener Conference a couple years ago. And I was in on the loop because I was a good friend of Nora Wojciechowski's and we had gotten the seeds to Greg when he attended our conference. Nora had given it to him. So Mike has done a lot of research trying to find the history of where that seed was from and to make sure that it grew true to what uh, it had been presented to him. So he spent a lot of time on it in the last year and a half. That's nice. Okay. Anybody else have any, any questions or to add? If you're having any problems, you feel free to use the chat or I have my email up too, so I can see that if you are having trouble with the Zoom aspect of things. Feel free to ask that as well. You're welcome. <laughs> that was definitely a great presentation, Mary. We definitely appreciate you coming. Oh, thank you. And I, I feel bad because it's shorter than I normally talk, but it's like very basic information and from there it's more getting the history of the different vegetables you know um but there's so many that that it's hard to to i'd be all night on every different little vegetable <laughs> <laughs> we'd probably still be sitting here listening to you too with, with oh gosh with what to put in our garden for next year yeah mary i live in an apartment and i love that you offered plants that are shorter and can be grown in pots the carrots were so nice and I love the beets so the size of the beets are just perfect for container gardening. 
Yeah, it's really more and more people are beginning to realize you can do some great container gardening and it's just a matter of checking out the size of the plant. And a lot of hybrids are good for that, or not hybrids, a lot of heirlooms are good for that. So I'm glad that help, that was helpful. It was very good. Thank you. Hey, Nora, did, did you have a question, Nora? I saw you raised your hand earlier and looks like you got yourself a mute, muted, okay. Did you have a question for Mary? Yes, but how do you do it? Can you hear me? We can, can hear, hear you. Oh, okay. All right. It was on the heirloom tomatoes. Uh, she mentioned a, a, a brand of brandy wine. Are there any others that are really good? Uh, Cherokee purple was another one I mentioned. It's a really nice dark tomato. Um, there's a number of uh, like yellow pear, the little tomatoes, the, the cherry type and the grape type. Um, but I, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of all their names. Uh, I would suggest trying to um, contact a couple of the companies that only grow the heirloom type, like uh, the Seed Savers or Annie's. They should be able to give you a, a nice variety of different tomatoes you can go with, depending on the color of tomato you would like or the size um, you want to grow. Well, I love heirloom tomatoes and I try to get them all year round and I usually can get them from a certain, you know, store, but they, I notice they taste differently at different times of the year. So I don't know whether they get different types or what they do. Yeah, there's a, a number of different varieties of heirlooms available at the different farmers markets. Um, so, uh, why they taste differently as they mature maybe uh, is just the way that particular fruit grows. Uh, I mean, those tomatoes are. Oh, okay. Um, okay. All right. Just, I was just wondering, uh, because I liked certain ones, but then when I asked them what the brand was, they didn't know. Oh, they weren't, they didn't have the actual type or variety listed? I guess not, because when I, I said, well, I bought them a week ago, and I liked the ones you had then, and, and they really tasted really sweet and everything, and I asked them what, what the name of that particular one was, and they couldn't answer me. Yeah, um, it, it could, if they're selling a variety, they can't always uh, tell you after the fact. The best thing to do is when you purchase it, get the name of the plant right away, or the particular variety. Um, right away. So that way, when you do go back, you can ask if they have it available again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll do that. Anybody else have any, any questions or anything that they wanted to add? I know Jackie just mentioned in chat about Karen Golden, who was somebody that um, probably has some heirlooms too. And we'll see one of our vendors at the conference next year since we missed out this year. Um, does anybody else have anything to, to add or any questions? Oh, um, deer tongue. There is a, a variety of deer tongue lettuce, and it's uh, Kind of looks like a deer's tongue when they stick it out. It's kind of pointed at the end. Uh, some uh, the seed savers has one called Amish deer tongue. There's a couple of other deer tongues, but basically the name deer tongue will be in that lettuce, and it's a it's a type of bib lettuce, I believe. So yeah, it's really fun because when you get some of the names on some of these vegetables, it's like just a hoot, you know. It's like you know, how, how many kids can go around telling the others, I had, uh, you know, dragon heart or dragon tongue or this, that, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, there was another one. Um, oh, what was it? I can't think. I had a thing around here before. Uh, I can't remember. There was one with a really funny name and I can't remember what it was. Shoot. As soon as we're done with this, I'll remember what it was, but yeah. Uh, but there's a lot of really fun vegetables to grow with kids just for their name you know, to let the, the to uh, make it more interesting. Yeah, so. And the, for, for those of you who aren't seeing the chat right now, Jackie did just say that that company that was supposed to be at the conference was Michigan Heirlooms. So you can look for them if you're looking for some plants. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to add or free to 
pipe up and pass away. Well, really appreciate your time, Mary, and thank you for for giving us some some new <laughs> new old varieties to uh, check out and add to our vegetable gardens next year. I know. I'm going to have to find some more space in my garden. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I've got to get time to really enlarge my garden. That's that's <laughs> next year's project. This year, I'm just trying to get it back in order. So, right. But, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for thank your time. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome.